3. Naturalism. Now to go on to the subject of naturalist distortion, it has become clear here that departures from the natural and healthy standards of music are on the increase. Elements of crude naturalism are penetrating more and more into our music. Ninety years ago Serov warned against the passion for crude naturalism in the following words. In nature there is an infinity of sound of the most diverse and varied description. In some cases they can be given names like noise, thunder, rumble, crackle, splashing, droning, humming, tinkling, howling, creaking, whistling, talking, whispering, rustling and so on. In others they cannot be expressed in speech. Any of these sounds are used as material in the musical language only in exceptional cases as, for example, the ringing of bells, the clashing of cymbals, the tinkling of a triangle, or the sound of drums and tambourines and so on. The musical material proper is sound of a special character. Is it not true and right that in musical compositions the sound of cymbals and drums should be the exception and not the rule? Is it not clear that not every natural sound should be taken into musical creations? Yet how frequent among us is this unforgivable passion for vulgar naturalism, which to all intents and purposes is a step backwards. It has to be said frankly that a great number of works by contemporary composers are so saturated with naturalistic sounds that they remind one either of a dentist drill or a musical murder, if you will excuse the expression. Only, mind you, there is no force whatever behind it all. This is the first step beyond the limits of the rational, beyond the limits not only of normal human emotions but of normal human intellect. There are, it is true, fashionable, theories to the effect that a pathological condition is at a higher state, and that schizophrenics and paranoiacs can attain spiritual heights in their ravings unattainable by an ordinary person in a normal state. These theories are not, of course, fortuitous. They are very characteristic of the period of decay and corruption of bourgeois culture. But let us leave all these experiments to the insane and let us ask for normal, human music from our composers. What has been the result of the disregard of the laws and standards of musical creation? Music has taken revenge on those who attempted to mutilate it. When music ceases to have content and to be highly artistic, and becomes crude, ugly and vulgar, it ceases to fulfill the demands which are the reasons for its existence it ceases to be music. You may be surprised that the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party asks for beauty and grace in music. Yes, we declare that we are for beautiful and graceful music, for a music which is capable of satisfying the aesthetic requirements and artistic tastes of the Soviet people, and these requirements and tastes have developed to an incredible extent. The people assesses a musical composition according to how profoundly it reflects the spirit of our epoch in people, and according to how intelligible it is to the wide masses. For what is it in music that is proof of genius? It is not something that can only be grasped by a small group of esthetes. A musical work is proved to be a work of genius by the scope of its content and depth, by its skill, and by the number of people who appreciate it by the number of people it is able to inspire. Not all that is readily grasped is a work of genius, but all that is real genius is readily grasped, and the greater the genius the more intelligible is it to the broad masses of the people. And Serov was profoundly right when he said that, but for the genuinely and timelessly beautiful in their art there would be admiration neither for Homer, Dante and Shakespeare, nor for Raphael, Titian and Poussin, nor for Pallas Rena, Handel and Gluck. The greater a work of music, the more responsive the chords it strikes in the human spirit. From the point of view of musical perception man is such a miraculous receiver, working on thousands of wavelengths. I dare say there are better comparisons, that for him the tone of one note, the sound from one string, or a single emotion, is insufficient. A composer capable of striking only one answering note, or only a few strings, is inadequate, since modern man, and particularly our Soviet man, 
is a highly complex organ of receptivity. Kalinka, Tchaikovsky and Serov wrote of the Russian people as being highly developed musically, and this at a time when classical music had not yet found a wide understanding among them. In the years of Soviet power, the people's musical culture has developed to an extraordinary degree. The artistic tastes of our previously merely musical people have become greatly enriched, thanks to a wide dissemination of classical music. If you have allowed music to become impoverished, and if, as in Murad Eli's opera, the full possibilities of an orchestra and abilities of singers are not utilized, then you have ceased to satisfy the musical demands of your audience. As you sow, so you shall reap. Do not let composers who have written works unintelligible to the people think that, while the people may not understand this music now, they will do so when they have become more mature. The people do not need music which they cannot understand. The composers ought to reproach themselves instead of the people, they should subject their work to a critical appraisal in order to understand why they did not please their people, why they did not merit approval, and in order to understand what they have to do to make themselves understood by the people and win their approval. That is the foundation upon which one's creative work must be reorganized. IV. Professional Skill now I want to go on to deal with the danger of losing professional skill. Formless distortion impoverishes music and at the same time brings with it the danger of professional skill being lost. In this connection we must examine another widespread error, that of believing that classical music is rather simple, and that modern music is more complex, of believing that the complication and technique of modern music represents a step forward, since all development proceeds from the simple to the more complex and from the particular to the general. It is not true that complication of any kind whatever is the equivalent to a growth in skill. Whoever thinks that any kind of complication represents progress makes a profound mistake. Here is an example. We know that literary Russian makes use of a great number of foreign words, and we know that Lenin ridiculed the misuse of foreign words and that he came out strongly for a cleansing of the native language of foreign-bred impurities. A complication of the language by way of introducing a foreign word for which there is a full equivalent in the Russian language never did represent a progressive step. For instance, the foreign word low sung, German for slogan, has now been replaced by the Russian word prisiv, and does not an exchange of this kind represent a step forward? So it is in music, too. A purely superficial complication of composition methods camouflage is a tendency to impoverish music. Musical language is becoming inexpressive. So much that is crude and vulgar and false is being introduced into music that it is beginning to fail in its function, which is to provide pleasure. Or is the aesthetic significance of music to be abolished? Is that what innovation means? Is music a soliloquy, the composer talking to himself? And if that is the case, why inflict it on the people? This music becomes anti-popular and super-individualist and the people have every right to be indifferent to its fate and are indifferent to it. If an audience is expected to praise music which is crude, ugly and vulgar, and based on a tonality and continuous dissonance, and if false notes and combinations of false notes become the rule, and assonance the exception, then the fundamental standards of music are being abandoned. The sum total of this represents a threat to the existence of music, just as cubism and futurism have as their aim nothing more nor less than the decay of painting. Music which deliberately ignores the normal human emotions and jars the mind and nervous system can never be popular or of use to society. The narrow passion for symphonic music without text has been mentioned here. It is incorrect to ignore all the many genres of music. What it leads to can again be seen in the example of Murad Eli's opera. Just call to mind how liberal the great masters of the art were in this respect. They well understood that the people demanded music in a variety of genres. Why are you so unlike your great predecessors? You are far more hard-hearted in this than those who occupied the summits of their art and yet wrote songs for the people, solo, choral and orchestral.
Melodiousness is beginning to disappear. A passionate emphasis on rhythm at the expense of melody is characteristic of modern music. Yet we know that music can give pleasure only if it contains the essential elements in a specific harmonic combination. One-sided emphasis leads to a violation of the correct interaction of the various elements of music and cannot, of course, be accepted by the normal human ear. The use of instruments for purposes outside their functions also comes under the heading of distortion. When, for example, the piano is turned into a percussion instrument, the role of vocal music is being curtailed for the benefit of a one-sided development of instrumental music. Vocal music itself concerns itself less and less with the demands of the normal standards of singing. The criticisms from the vocalists, expressed here by comrades Dersinskaya and Katalskaya, must be taken into the fullest consideration. All these and similar departures from the standards of the art of music represent not only a violation of the fundamentals of musical sound but also an assault upon the fundamental physiology of normal human hearing. Unfortunately the theory which deals with the physiological effects of music on the human organism has been insufficiently developed. It should be borne in mind, however, that bad, unharmonious music undoubtedly disturbs the balance of mental and physiological functions. V. Tasks of Soviet Music What conclusions can be drawn? The significance of the classical heritage must be fully restored. The danger of destruction threatening music from the formless trend must be stressed and this trend must be condemned as an assault upon the edifice of the art created by the great masters of musical culture. Our composers must reorient themselves and turn towards their people. All of them must realize that our party, expressing the interests of our state and our people, will support only a healthy and progressive trend in music, the trend of Soviet socialist realism. Comrades, if you value the lofty calling of Soviet composer, you must prove yourselves capable of serving your people better than you have done up to the present. You are facing a serious test. The formless trend in music was condemned by the party 12 years ago. Since then the government has awarded Stalin prizes to many of you, among them those guilty of formalism. The rewards you received were in the nature of a substantial advanced payment. We did not consider that your compositions were free of defects, but we were patient, expecting our composers to find within themselves the strength to choose the right road. But it is now clear to everybody that the intervention of the party was necessary. The Central Committee tells you bluntly that our music will never win glory along the road you have chosen. Soviet composers have two highly responsible tasks. The chief one is to develop and perfect Soviet music. The other is to protect Soviet music against penetration by elements of bourgeois decay. We must not forget that the USSR is now the true custodian of the musical culture of mankind, just as she is in all other fields. 2. A bulwark of human civilization and culture against bourgeois corruption and decay. We must take into account the fact that alien bourgeois influences from abroad will muster what remains of a capitalist outlook in the minds of some Soviet intellectuals in frivolous and crazy attempts to replace the treasures of Soviet musical culture by the pitiful tatters of modern bourgeois art. For this reason not only the musical but also the political ear of Soviet composers must be very sensitive. Your contact with the people must be closer than ever before. The ear for music must be in, ear for criticism too. You should keep track of the various stages through which art is passing in the West. But it is your task not only to prevent the penetration of bourgeois influences into Soviet music, it is your task, too, to consolidate the supremacy of Soviet music and to create a mighty Soviet musical culture which will embody all that is best from the past and which will reflect Soviet society of today and enable the culture and the communist consciousness of our people to attain still greater heights. We Bolsheviks do not deny our cultural heritage. On the contrary, we subject to a critical study the cultural heritage of all peoples and all ages in order to draw from it all that can inspire the working people of Soviet society to great achievements in labor, science and culture. 
you must help the people in this, and if you do not set yourselves this task and devote yourselves wholeheartedly to it and give to it all your enthusiasm and creative ardor, you are not fulfilling your historic role. Comrades, we would very much like, we fervently wish, to have in existence among us our own, mighty few, a group which would be more numerous and more influential still than that which in its day sent the fame of its talents around the world and glorified our people. In order to achieve this you must clear out of your path all that might weaken you and select only the means and equipment which will make you strong and mighty. If you use to the full our great musical heritage and at the same time develop it in the spirit of the new demands of our great epic, you will become a Soviet, mighty few. We want to see this backwardness through which you are passing overcome as quickly as possible, so that you can the sooner reorient yourselves and become a glorious cohort of Soviet composers, the pride of the entire Soviet people. Notes 1. Erpigonism, from Epigon, an inferior follower or imitator, translator. 2. The Mighty Few was a group of Russian musicians formed in 1861 by Mabula Kairov. Others associated in the group were Kui, Mussorgsky, Rimsky-Korsakov, Borodin and, to a limited extent, Tchaikovsky. Translator Chapter IV On Philosophy Speech at a Conference of Soviet Philosophical Workers, 1947 Comrades the discussion of the book by Comrade Alexandrov has not been confined to the subject under debate. It has transcended it in breadth and depth, posing also more general questions of the situation of the philosophical front. The discussion has been transformed into a kind of all-union conference on the condition of our scientific work in philosophy. This, of course, is quite natural and legitimate. The creation of a textbook on the history of philosophy, the first Marxist textbook in this sphere, represents a task of enormous scientific and political significance. It is therefore not accidental that the Central Committee has given so much attention to the question and has organized the present discussion. To prepare and write a good textbook on the history of philosophy means to equip our intellectuals, our cadres, our youth with a new, powerful ideological weapon and at the same time to take a great step forward in the development of Marxist-Leninist philosophy. Hence, the high level of the requirements for such a textbook was expressed in the discussion. The extension of the range of the discussion has, therefore, been profitable. Its results will, without doubt, be great. The more so since we have here dealt not only with questions connected with the evaluation of the textbook, but also with the broader problems of philosophical work. I shall permit myself to discuss both themes. It is not at all my intention to summarize the discussion. This is the task of the author. I speak as a participant in the debate. I ask in advance to be excused if I have recourse to quotations. Although Comrade Baskin has repeatedly warned all of us against this procedure, of course, it is easy for him, an old philosophical sea wolf, to plow through seas and oceans without navigation instruments, by the eye of inspiration, as sailors say. But you will have to permit me, a novice, threading for the first time the unsteady deck of the philosophical ship in time of terrible storm, to use quotations as a sort of compass which will prevent me from being driven off my correct course. I now pass to the remarks on the textbook. I, the shortcomings of Comrade Alexandrov's book. I believe that from a textbook on the history of philosophy we have a right to demand the fulfillment of the following conditions which, in my opinion, are elementary. 1. It is necessary that the subject, the history of philosophy as a science, be precisely defined. 2. The textbook should be scientific, that is, based on fundamental present achievements of dialectical and historical materialism. 3. It is essential that the exposition of the history of philosophy be a creative and not a scholastic work. It should be directly linked with the tasks of the present, should lead to their elucidation, 
and should give the perspective for the further development of philosophy. 4. The facts cited should be fully verified. 5. The style should be clear, precise and convincing. I consider that this textbook does not meet these demands. Let us begin with the subject of science. Comrade Kivenko has pointed out that Comrade Alexandrov does not present a clear idea of the subject of the science, and that although the book contains a large number of definitions having individual importance, in that they illuminate only individual aspects of the question, one does not find in the work an exhaustive general definition. That observation is entirely correct. Neither is the subject of the history of philosophy as a science defined. The definition given on page 14 is incomplete. The definition on page 22, italicized, apparently as a basic definition, is essentially incorrect. Should one agree with the author that, the history of philosophy is the history of the progressive, ascending development of man's knowledge of the surrounding world, it would mean that the subject of the history of philosophy coincides with that of the history of science in general, in which case philosophy itself would appear as the science of sciences. This conception was long ago rejected by Marxism. A. Materialism versus Idealism the author's assertion that the history of philosophy is also the history of the rise and development of many contemporary ideas is likewise incorrect because the concept contemporary is here identified with the concept scientific, which, naturally, is erroneous. In defining the subject of the history of philosophy, it is necessary to proceed from the definition of philosophical science given by Marx, Engels, Lenin and Stalin. This revolutionary side of Hegel's philosophy was adopted and developed by Marx. Dialectical materialism no longer needs any philosophy standing above the other sciences. Of former philosophy there remains the science of thought and its laws. Formal logic and dialectics. And dialectics, as understood by Marx, and in conformity with Hegel, includes what is now called the theory of knowledge, or epistemology, which, too, must regard its subject matter historically, studying and generalizing the origin and development of knowledge, the transition from non-knowledge to knowledge. Lenin, Karl Marx. Consequently the scientific history of philosophy is the history of the birth, rise and development of the scientific materialist world outlook and its laws. Inasmuch as materialism grew and developed in the struggle with idealist trends, the history of philosophy is at the same time the history of the struggle of materialism with idealism. As to the scientific character, depth and breadth of the book from the standpoint of its utilizing contemporary attainments of dialectical and historical materialism, in this respect, too, it suffers from many serious inadequacies.